So probably the earliest uh, experience with death was with my parents. Uh, initially my father, who died when I was in my 30s. Um, he had a foreshortened life because he uh, served in the Second World War. And uh, I lived in Melbourne, they lived in Sydney. Uh, the story was he felt heart issues, went to hospital, went to the emergency department, had his bag packed, assuming he was going to be in hospital. And basically they said, um, it's probably best for you to go home. He went home and he died at home the next day, essentially, with, with relatively no notice. And that was, in a sense, a big shock to us all. It, he was only admitted, or he only went to the emergency department, and I think they were, in the emergency department style, you know, wanting to get rid of people and so on. And so they didn't provide any advice about what prognosis was. They may have made a mistake about what they thought prognosis was. Um, we didn't challenge any of that. Either they made a mistake about prognosis or they knew what the prognosis was and they didn't talk about it. My mother la lived another 20 years after that and she had increasing number of hospitalisations over the time for various things. And so we knew what the evidence is about increased hospitalisation in the last year of life. And so we knew that her death was, was coming. And eventually she was admitted to hospital for something. And she was admitted under the care of a geriatrician, which I thought was very good, actually. And the geriatrician said to my sister, who was her carer, you realise your mother's going to die during this admission. I thought, wow. And so my sister rang me. I was able to fly up to Sydney with my daughter. We were able to say goodbye to my mother while she was still conscious and recognised us and all those sorts of things. So she wasn't in an intensive care unit with tubes coming out of her and no, no, no ability to communicate. So we were able to say goodbye. My daughter was able to say goodbye. She recognised us and uh, she died two days later when we were back in Melbourne. So that I, even though it was a hospital death, I think it was a good death because it was relatively quick, she wasn't in pain, the family was advised, the family were all able to be there, and so I think uh, that was in contrast. Even though my father died at home, it was an unprepared death, and I think that's one of the evidences of a good death is that you're ready for it and you accept it and you're able to say goodbyes and so on. I try to avoid ever using the term life-saving treatment. You see it in the papers, in the media, all the time. In a, and the reality, of course, is everybody dies. And all you can hope for with a new treatment is life extending, that your life would be longer now than it would otherwise have been. And we seem to think, the media especially, abetted by medical researchers and the health system want to convey to the public that we are all immortal, and we're not. And so this idea that there's going to be this magic invention that if only the NHMRC gives me a little bit more money, everybody's going to live forever, is really doing us all a disservice. What has affected me a lot is this recognition that we, health policy people, the health system, the media, are conniving with this idea that death is an optional choice. And it's not. And we've got to actually make it easier for these death conversations to take place, make it easier for a GP, for example, to talk to someone when they're maybe about to go into a residential aged care facility that, you know, you do realise that you may die in the next in years and so you know give us some advice about how you want incidents to be handled and so on and society as a whole doesn't make those conversations easy because a lot of people are death denying and death comes as a surprise to them when as I said as you get older and you have more frequent hospital admissions you should see that as a sign that you know your body is getting frailer and more systems are breaking down and eventually you are going to die. And so it behoves you to actually talk to your family about what your expectations are and 
and what, how you'd like to die and, and so on. Now, we don't all get to die the way we'd like to die, but at least we can have those conversations and document those conversations. 20 or 30 years ago, there tended not to be as much in the medical curriculum about communication and about communicating death and so on. And these were set as, if they were taught, they were sort of in soft subjects that weren't examined. And the real stuff was the, the treatment stuff. And, you know, the whole ethos of medical education is we're here to, to in fact, come and save lives, to provide cure. And so the providing care and the recognition of end of life care was de-emphasised in the, in the medical curriculum. Now it's less so now, but still a lot is the emphasis on cure. And so if you haven't had experience with it, you haven't had training with it, you haven't been able to practice these sorts of conversations, it's not a surprise that people aren't as, as good at these conversations as they might otherwise be or they feel uncertain about these conversations. You don't have to do it in every consultation, but you might over time soften up and so on and talk about choices and options and what you might want to see happen and blah, blah, blah. It is a much easier thing, especially when you have a relationship. So I think there's a bit of history of training. There's a bit of, they are uncomfortable conversations because society as a whole, as I said, is death denying. So there's a whole conspiracy really to say, don't ask, don't tell, you know, this is not something that you do in polite conversation. But the reality is we all die and we all have to, we all have to recognise we all die. And the, the issue is, are we going to make it easier on our carers, on our family and so on in understanding what our wishes are relative to being less easy for our carers and our family and so on? I think I've seen even in recent months, the euphemisms, you know, they have passed and all those sorts of things, which I, I just think, you know, is contributing to this death-denying society that we've got to, it is death, I mean. So there's that issue, which I think we need to uh, recognise and, and uh, work on to make sure all of our language is recognising this reality. I think also people go into medicine, go into nursing because they, they want to help people, they want to, inverted commas, save lives. The vast majority of the medical profession are not in palliative care or geriatric beds and they're, they're in the, in, in a sense, in the curative side of medicine. And, you know, I know these stories of, um, especially in oncology, where they try these drugs and they don't work and then, oh, let's try these ones and they don't work. And, well, let's, so they're not actually recognising that people's goals of care change. They're not asking people about, you know, what are you, where, what stage are you at? Are you in the stage, I think there's a chance, Doc, you know, give me another five years or I, I really just want to live till I see my daughter or son get married or whatever it is. You know, what are your current goals of care? Many doctors find it hard to uh, have that conversation about where are you now? And the right answer is going to be different for different people. But once they've started to have those conversations, the, the conversations we've been having about medical treatment and surgical treatment and so on, we think that we probably need to have start to have a different conversation of what are your goals of care now and what are our goals of care and why are they there and why are they not? So many clinicians assume that everybody is in the do everything you can doc sort of stage of their goals of care and they don't check in uh, because it is more comfortable for them to do things. I mean, surgeons like doing surgery. That's why they became surgeons. And so they want to intervene. They want to do surgery rather than saying, I've looked at the film and I don't think surgery is the right thing for you. you know, so it's just that much harder. Uh, and uh, physicians in the same boat and so on. I don't really like to talk much about death in an economic context because I think that's not where society wants us to be. But nevertheless, the reality is that a person who has received palliative care costs less than a person who doesn't, has less 
ED visits, fewer ICU admissions, fewer hospital admissions, and lives longer. So they live longer with palliative care and they cost less with palliative care. So in a sense, you say, what, what is the downside here? You know, why aren't we making palliative care much more available? Because it's not always available. In many cases, persist in providing interventions, providing diagnostic interventions in the last week of life. There was a paper published a couple of years ago out of Peter Mack where they looked at when was radiology and pathology and so on ordered and there were people who were going to die the next day who were having these diagnostic interventions. And you think, really? You know, why were you doing that? Why had the clinical staff not begun to say, hello, we need to be preparing this person and for death in the near future and getting them to do another diagnostic test is not really preparing them that they might die in the next day. And you think, you know, why can't the clinical staff let go? And I don't think, by the way, that it's the patients who are always saying that. Certainly some patients want to say, do everything you can, doc. But you really have to say to the patient, doing everything you can, doc, means you won't be able to talk to your family. You won't be able to talk to your carers and so on. There is a cost to you and your family about doing that. You know, when you, you do uh, a, an audit of that death, for example, very often an audit team would say, oh, they did everything they could and the death was inevitable, rather than saying, did they do too much? You know, why wasn't palliative care initiated earlier? Because the default is you'll get criticised for not intervening rather than a default saying we should have given that patient more options earlier. Um, I think in one of the... I read an article where one of the hospitals has an automatic referral to palliative care given these criteria and it's automatic and you have to override it and I think that you know these sorts of systems interventions make it easier for some of these things to happen. So I had a, a friend who had uh, breast cancer and she lived with breast cancer for probably 20 years I think in and out of remission. And for a lot of that, she was able to work and contribute and so on, but then sometimes the treatment just became so bad and you'd go and visit her and sometimes it was before her blood transfusion and sometimes after, sometimes she was anemic, sometimes she wasn't. But she was continuing to live a meaningful life through treatment. That was her story. Or well, she also knew that she wasn't going to live forever and that she knew that sometimes the treatments were getting longer, more exhausting, more demanding of her husband, and so on. So she knew all of these things were happening in her life. And she continued the treatment uh, right towards the end, but it would become to be more and more palliative, that she recognised that the cancer was there, there was no curing now, and that it was about management of pain and also her life with her family and, and saying goodbye and so on. So it, it, became, it was really, and she was a very strong woman, and so she was able to manage that tension between life extension and palliation. Not everybody is as strong as that and is able to do that, especially if they've fed the lines in the media that medicine is this magic box of tricks which can save everybody in inverted commas. And that's, I think, what we have to be working with the community and the, the media has a particular responsibility and I, every now and again when I see one of these outrageous stories, I tweet about it and I say, is this responsible? You know, you know, they say, oh, we've done this magnificent thing and you know, the, it appears as if it's going to come tomorrow but really there's another 10 years before this thing will go into clinical practice and you think, really, why are you doing that? And um, we do have to balance those sorts of miracle medicine stories with what do you do when medicine has to admit there's no cure anymore and we have to change the goals of care. The patient has to sort of say, what do I want to do now? What, what, what are my goals of care now? And we have to make those conversations about that more frequent and easier.
So a good death is, is different for different people. People want different things. And so there's no right answer that dying at home equals good death. So a good death, first of all, is a death which the person who's dying in their immediate support system thinks is a good death. And that might be, it, it's, it's almost inevitably, a death without pain, a death with communication. That is, you know, being able to communicate with the people around you. It's almost certainly a death with people around you in, in, and so on. So it, it has certain attributes and it's also, to some extent, a death for which you have some notice. I talked about my mother, for example. I live in Melbourne, she lived in Sydney. It took time to get from one place to the other. My, when my father died, he was in Sydney, I was in Melbourne, I couldn't get there. There was just no way I could get there when it became obvious that he was going to die in the next few hours. I just couldn't do it. So a, a death, a good death involves a bit of recognition that, as the geriatrician said in my mother's case, you realise she's going to die during this admission. And she did. So there's a combination of things, but it's going to be different for different people. I think there's been a, an outrage at about some of the ways we talked about death and dying. Early in the pandemic, the chief health officers or the politicians would get up and say, oh, these number of people died, but they had underlying conditions, or that they had, they're over 70 or whatever. And so they were dismissing the lives of these people. And so a person who's over 70 has an expectation of life, and, and that life was foreshortened. And so we should have said, whoa, that's a foreshortened life, whether it was a life over 70. So people who are over 70 or over 75 or over 80 have value in their lives. But we also need to say, simultaneously, and it's not in conflict, we need to make a death easy if the death is going to happen in the next two or three days, that if the death is inevitable. That is, if they are having this immense trouble breathing, we need to let the family know that this is something that we can't intervene and deal with. And I think there was more of that. With COVID, there was more letting the family know that, that we've seen this before. This is, we don't have treatments, this is a new disease, and we think this person, your brother, father, mother, sister, is going to die in the next few days. So I think there was more of those conversations, whether they're all handled well, of course, and also, one of the tragedies of the pandemic was sometimes those conversations had to be done by video or by telephone rather than face to face. And I think the clinicians who did that have just got to be praised so much because it's not only hard for the family, the carers and so on, but it's hard for the clinician because the clinician wants to be there. And yes, you're there if you're on video, but you're not really there. And so I think the recognition of the difficulty of that, I think, is something that I think the society as a whole hasn't given, um, hasn't shown their gratitude enough for. I think there are a number of things that have happened over the last five years which have increased the status and relevance and place of palliative care. First of all, we've seen in, in all states, and not the territories, but the development of legislation about assisted dying. And of course, assisted dying is not the same as palliative care, and I don't want to pretend that they are. Basically, alongside the introduction of assisted dying legislation has been a promise to dramatically improve palliative care. One of the arguments against assisted dying was, oh, you don't need assisted dying if you have palliative care. Well, one of the responses is, let's make sure no one misses out on palliative care. So there's been a, a big increase in emphasis on palliative care and an availability of palliative care services. Whether that's enough or not is another matter, but that's happened. Secondly, we've had the pandemic where people dying has been much more in the forefront. I think um, COVID-19 is now the second most common cause of death uh, in 2022 so far. So it's really increased the presence of death in the media and so on. And so I think associated with that is what do you do when there's nothing you can do 
and who is trained to deal with that, who is an expert at that and who can help with that? Well, the answer, of course, is palliative care. The longer your professional career, the more you come in contact with colleagues who die. Um, I've had colleagues die in car accidents, for example. But the one that I think impacted me most, in, and not in, in, a, in a different sort of way, was a colleague who took his own life while working in uh, the Health Department of Victoria. And uh, it made me reflect on toxic workplaces. It made me reflect on the sorts of things that might have contributed to his death and what I'd only spoken to him the day before or the day before that, I forget, you know, a couple of days before. And I, you know, it makes you reflect on what you might have said or what you didn't see and so on and so forth. So it wasn't his death per se, but the manner of his death and the fact that it came into our lives that made us think about contributing factors and so on. You know, that experience has made me much more conscious of the need for workplace support. Um, nowadays we call it in employee assistance programs and so on, but I'm very, very conscious of the, of the need to ensure that those sorts of supports are available. But having said that, an EAP, an employee assistance plan, program, sort of personalises the issue and, you know, it's you are the one that needs help rather than the the workplace itself needs to be a supportive workplace and so it's management's job to make sure that staff are not overstressed, there is no bullying culture and all of those sorts of things which I think contribute to the increased rate of people taking their own lives and being stressed and going off on leave and so on. It's, we, we have to be careful not to personalise it about the individual but see it as a systems, as a systems issue. It's the role of a of a inverted commas compassionate leader. Organisations can be compassionate, societies can be compassionate or they can be not compassionate. So I think we need to have a leadership style which is about being compassionate and, and recognising that all of us at some time go through a friend or a relative or whatever dying and we build organisations and societies which support the person who's grieving, the person who has lost someone. And so we as leaders need to exhibit compassion and create compassion in an organisation, which in a sense is in dealing with compassion in the context of death, you're also creating an organisation which is supportive in all sorts of other reasons, supportive for someone who has mental health issues, supporting for someone who's transitions, transitioning in terms of their gender identity and so on. So it, compassion is, is a benefit much more generally and much more widely than one might think rather than just simply about death. Fifty years ago, for a health professional or a man especially, you were supposed to suck it up and, you know, be manly and bottle it inside you. And now it is much more acceptable, but not totally and completely acceptable, to recognise where we are and where we're coming from and the issues that we're dealing with, both at home and in our workplace and so on. It is certainly one of the things that has changed a lot is the increasing recognition of the critical importance of mental health issues. We don't always have the right language to talk about it, but it's something that organisations need to understand, especially health service organisations, that you cannot expect all the staff to be heroes all the time and that some of what they see and some of what they experience needs debriefing. Need, they need to actually grieve or they need to talk about it or they need to have workplace assistance to actually get the workplace, the team, to understand what is happening within the team, within the organisation in terms of what is overall being expected of them. Over the last few years, I've thought a lot about what my personal position is on assisted dying, for example. Do I think it's morally permissible or not morally permissible? 
And so it made me think a lot about what I think about human life, about death and about people's choices and goals of care and all those sorts of things. In the Victorian discussion, I read through all of the submissions to the Legislative Council Review of Assisted Dying and you heard these terrible, terrible, terrible stories. I could only read a few of them every day because they were just too overwhelming to read them all in, in one sitting. People missing out on palliative care, people being forced into terrible deaths because of our environment, because of the society, because we're not giving them the support they needed. And so I became quite convinced and quite vocal in the argument for palliative care. It's one of the reasons we started some work at Grattan on, on dying, that we, we wanted to make sure that everybody everywhere all the time had available the supports they needed to make their dying an easier process for them and their family. And still, at the time, people were missing out on palliative care and dying the most horrible deaths. And so it is something that re-energised me to be on about making it easier for people to die in a way which is consistent with what they wanted to do, in a way which helps their family and helps them, supports them. As I said, in, in my mother's case, you know, the geriatrician said, you know she's going to die during this episode. Basically, you've only got five days to prepare yourself, folks. And so my daughter and I could fly up to Sydney. We could actually talk to her. She recognised me. She was in a bed, a hospital bed, admittedly, but not in an ICU and, you know, able to communicate, able to say goodbye. We were able to have our grief and say goodbye rather than saying goodbye to her when she was in her coffin. We did that as well, but, you know, it was much easier to say goodbye in person, talking to her and her recognising us both.